So our worship today, what are we going to start with? Yes, be still for the presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. Grace, mercy and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, 
we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let's pray the collect for today. Almighty God, whose only Son has opened for us a new and living way into your presence, give us pure hearts and steadfast wills to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now Matt's going to read us the first lesson. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favouritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonoured the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? It is not... Is, is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you are really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by a law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it? My brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works, can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what good, what is the good of that? So by faith itself, if it has no works, is dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our next hymn takes up that idea for the healing of the nations.
to Matt. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him. And she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by the way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee, in the region of Decapolis. They brought him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Epithala, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So do we have a Julie? Yes, you do. Hooray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sometimes I despair. Then I get angry. I found myself writing that on social media the other day when I read about a child not being allowed to do PE at school because their wheelchair tyres may mark the gym floor. Getting angry is a common thing. My husband said as much in his sermon last week. I should know. I listened to it twice within an hour with what Zoom and everything. I hope you are impressed by my devotion. Yes, I know. Twitter and other online sites are frequent calls of anger, but at least it's not like being unable to get into a shop or business in real life, which makes me frustrated and a bit angry. The absence of dropped curbs, people parking across from where they exist, narrow pavements full of stuff, don't get me started. And I have designer wheelchairs and can express myself very forcibly. Heaven help those who are discriminated against because of gender, race or other things that make them different and cannot find the forum or strength to object as loudly. In his letter that we have heard part of today, James gets properly angry about the way those who are poor and wearing dirty clothes are treated by those claiming to be citizen Christians. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favouritism, really believe in our Lord, glorious Lord Jesus Christ? He goes on to write of those people with gold rings and in fine clothes who get treated differently with respect and a real welcome, as opposed to a poor person in dirty clothes. James is arguing on two fronts that this is a bad idea, apart from the common decency. He says that it is the poor that God has chosen to be rich in faith and heirs of a kingdom, where it is the rich 
who will push and take you to court. It's quite an argument for enlightened self-interest, if you think about it. The poor believe because they have nothing else, whereas the rich have options to behave badly towards people. I'm aware that this might sound like socialism, but it was James that wrote it first. The other argument that James uses is that Christians obey the royal law according to scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, and that not to do so is a sin. It's tough stuff. If you treat the wealthy better based on appearance low, you are not fulfilling the basics of Christianity, says James. So what do we do with that idea? In a country where social care is being cut back, where universal credit has been reduced for families this month, where arguments about where Afghan refugees are to live is already bouncing around. I honestly don't know. Do I despair, then get angry? Let's look at the gospel. Mark writes in his brief, urgent style of the woman who approaches Jesus, a Gentile woman, a non-Jew. Her daughter is ill. She has, in Mark's words, a demon. Now, although I picked up quite a bit of medical knowledge and know something of illnesses that can affect children, I don't know what that means. We do know that it is sufficiently bad for the woman to pluck up the courage to speak to Jesus. After all, he doesn't want to be disturbed. She is a woman and so less regarded in the first century society. And to make things worse, she's not even a Jew. When Jesus has been preaching to Jews, helping Jews in the main throughout his ministry, we don't know how he refused. Maybe he was tired, angry, and did not want to be bothered. After all, we never get angry or fed up, too tired to speak to anyone. That's what my beloved husband says anyway. Let the children be fed first, he says, rather than throw their food to the dogs. Ouch. That is a put down to the woman, possibly implying that its healing powers should be given to the Jews first. She responds with a decent comeback, though. Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She is desperate, remember, and it makes her brave and articulate. Even the dogs, the old dogs, not much a much-loved pampered pet that can hope for crumbs, but for the leftovers. Even the Gentiles, women, can hope for the leftovers of power for healing. Jesus acknowledges her faith, her reasoning, and announces, for saying that, you may go, the demon has left your daughter and the child, the girl, is healed. Is it a reward for fast thinking or is it the healing power of Jesus overflowing anyway? We don't know. I think that it is interesting that Jesus has a mini debate with a woman over his power. The story of a woman with the issue of blood that merely believes touching Jesus' cloak will make her well is told that it is her faith that makes her well when others would cast her out. The Samaritan woman, the member of a disliked tribe, is shown Jesus' knowledge and compassion despite their differences. 
did the gospel writers choose these stories because they were just good examples of Jesus' power? Or is it that they were trying to make the point that Jesus' love and compassion was for both everyone, whatever their background, gender, or difference? James, in the end of this reading of verses picked out of the second chapter of the letter, this is definitely a time to read the whole thing, goes on to write of the need for faith with works. If someone is without clothes and food, he says, it is no good telling them to be at peace, warm and well fed. What is the good of that, he asks. Faith without works, according to James, is no good to man or beast, as we say at home. Jesus backed up his preaching and teaching with healing, with feeding people, with making a real difference in people's lives. Where does that leave us? We can believe in Jesus, God, in our society, in our country, that is still allowed, even encouraged. We can choose to come to church, take part in online services, be together to celebrate our faith in some ways. That, as we have been reminded in recent weeks with the takeover of Afghanistan, is a privilege not enjoyed by everyone in our world. And even if it is, what about those in our country who are unable to concentrate on faith or belief because they are too busy trying to make ends meet, trying to survive financially without the basics of food, adequate housing, the resources to afford school uniform for their children, Do we despair, get angry? Do we try to make a difference, to make our feelings known? Do we help with food, clothes, accommodation? I really don't know the answer. We do what we can. We have faith, and how do we do the work? There's a collection point for practical help for Afghan refugees at St Anne's Church in Derby. There is space in Primrose's shed for food for the food bank. There are various ways of contacting our MPs, our representatives. Our faith can make a difference in our lives. Let us pray to be shown how to make a difference in the lives of others. Amen. Thank you, Julie. Let's proclaim our faith in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, 
we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So for our anthem, a piece by the contemporary composer Margaret Ritzer, a setting of words by Lancelot Andrews. Open thou mine eyes and I shall see.
Lord, we pray for people worldwide who are suffering at this time. In particular, we think of those affected by the situation in Afghanistan, those grieving for the casualties, those still seeking to leave the country, and those Afghans who are frightened and unable to continue with their established way of life because of the restrictions enforced by the Taliban. It's hard for us to imagine living under a regime that does not allow girls and women to enjoy the freedom to access education, employ them, and the freedoms we take for granted. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the billions of people worldwide affected by the COVID pandemic. We pray that richer governments may make ethical choices about the distribution of vaccines. Also, we pray that these governments are successful in their efforts to balance the health of their people with the survival of their economies. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the people in America who've had their lives turned upside down by Hurricane Ida. Give strength, Lord, to those who have lost dearly loved relatives, who have lost their homes and possessions, and who are frightened for the future. Guide those making important resolutions that will affect climate change in the future. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray that all politicians in our country may exercise wisdom and integrity in all they do. We continue to pray for the NHS, which has been stretched to breaking point. We thank God for helping the scientists and health professionals to learn so much so quickly about the treatment of COVID patients. We pray for all those waiting for operations and treatments that have been delayed due to the pandemic. Some of these delays are having serious impact on the quality and length of people's lives. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those in our local community who've been affected by COVID, those experiencing poverty, and those struggling mentally with depression or lack of confidence. Show us how we can help these people, both financially and practically. We pray for organisations within our local community that they may continue to continue their work to help vulnerable people, the elderly, families and children who need some extra support. Help our local churches to find ways of supporting people in this area who need spiritual and practical help. Everyone deserves equal access to a peaceful, comfortable and fulfilled life. We ask, Lord, for your blessing and support for those who are sick, especially those known to us. The families of the deceased are in great need of comfort at their time of grieving, so we pray for them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for each member of our local family. Give us the insight to know how best to help when this is needed so that we may guide and support without causing any offence. We particularly ask for your blessings on all children returning to school after two strangely disrupted years, for those starting school for the first time, for the younger children going to nursery and playgroup, and for those leaving school for university or the big wide world of work. They'll all need extra understanding as their vital socialisation has been seriously disrupted. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lastly, we pray for ourselves, for guidance, support and courage to tackle the challenges that life throws at us. Help us to act non-judgmentally so that it cannot be said, as we heard in the reading from James, that we have made distinctions and become judges with evil thoughts. On the contrary, help us to truly love our neighbour as ourself. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And we bring our prayers together as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I'm not quite sure this was the best choice of him after all these letters about getting up and doing things, but this is the one they gave us. I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your backs. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold us in the palm of his hand. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Lovely. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Julie. And here is a piece from David called England's Glory by Nigel Ogden. <laughs>
Terve Aaven.